Rectory, lying on the periphery of the tiny hamlet whose name it bears, was once christened by paranormal investigator Harry Price, the most haunted house in England. A wealth of people, including five successive rectors, their wives, their families, as well as a group of select paranormal investigators, all claim to have experienced paranormal activity within the house and its grounds. So much has been published about Borley Rectory that it seems almost inconceivable that anything new could possibly be unearthed. Surprisingly, this is not the case. This is a genuine photograph taken in 1937 of Harry Price's ghost hunting kit. Among the numerous items included in his equipment were felt overshoes, steel tape for measuring room dimensions, drawing materials, flashlights, a bowl of mercury for detecting tremors, filaments for detecting movement, thermographs to measure any temperature variance in any of the controlled rooms, tapes for sealing doors and windows, and first aid supplies, including a flask of brandy in case anyone fainted. Price was also in the habit of taking a considerable amount of photographic equipment into an investigation. Whilst Price's still photographic studies of the rectory have been widely circulated, not a single frame of film shot on any of the movie cameras has ever been seen. The rectory had been built in 1863 by the Reverend Henry Bull, a man regarded by his parish as something of a spiritualist, who had oft recounted seeing the ghost of a nun, rumored in local parts to have been buried alive within the walls of a monastery that had once existed on the site. Indeed, it was said so influenced was he by the beliefs, not only had he built an octagonal summer house for the sole purpose of spying upon the phantom, but in time that he had been driven to brick up a dining room window to prevent her from looking in on family meals. Thank you. 
His four daughters recounted a variety of alarming experiences inside and outside the rectory. Ghost? What nonsense? I'll go and speak to it. I've had many communications with the spirits. Indeed, one can hail a spectre here as easily as one can hail a friend. <laughs> the only way for a spirit, if ignored, to make contact with the living is by means of some violent manifestation. I do declare that Upon my death, were I discontented, I would adopt such a means of communication myself. <laughs> With its legend now firmly established, and with such reports going undenied by the Reverend Ball, indeed he had, on numerous occasions, even threatened to return and haunt the place himself, the rectory's reputation as a haunted place became firmly entrenched. At the age of 49, Harry Bull marries Ivy, and the Bull sisters, who expected to spend the rest of their days at the rectory, are forced to leave. Upon Harry's death, whispers begin that the rector was murdered by Ivy. However, suspicions abound that the rumors may have originated from the Bull sisters, trying to discredit Harry's will. In 1949, a book was privately published by A.C. Henning, last rector of Borley. It was called Haunted Borley, in which he stated his belief that the phenomena at Borley were due to either the celebration of the Black Mass, or to witchcraft, or possibly to both. An elderly parishioner reported that when she first came to Borley, there was said to be a witch, not a woman, but a man. Two decades later, it was the turn of the Reverend Smith and his wife.
During the first weeks of their tenancy, Mrs. Smith made a gruesome discovery in the library. Finding no reason why the skull should be preserved or hidden in the library, Smith reverently had the relic buried in the churchyard. Soon after, however, Mr. and Mrs. Smith became aware of certain phenomena. These whispers were heard several times afterwards, although no actual words were distinguishable. Other phenomena experienced included mysterious bell ringing, keys continually falling from their locks, and slow, deliberate footsteps patrolling the passages and upper rooms. As with the Bull Sisters, apparitions too were witnessed by both Mrs. Smith and maids in her employment. The sight of this figure so disturbed one of the maids that she left the household after only two days of service. Mrs. Smith, VC Wall, your husband contacted my editor? From the Psychic Research Society. Uh, Daily Mirror. I think there's been some misunderstanding. Uh, Mrs. Smith, I believe you've been at the mercy of ghosts.
But the story of Borley Rectory's notoriety begins a little later in 1929 with the Daily Mirror journalist, Mr. V.C. War. Ghostly figures of headless coachmen. A nun believed to have been bricked up within the walls that appears and vanishes mysteriously. A screaming girl at the window of the blue room and dragging footsteps in empty halls. The scene of the ghostly visitations is the rectory at Borley a few miles from Long Melford, Suffolk. It is a building erected on part of the site of a great monastery, which, in the Middle Ages, was the scene of a gruesome tragedy. The present rector, the Reverend G. E. Smith, and his wife made the rectory their residence in the face of warnings by previous occupiers. Since their arrival, they have been puzzled and startled by a series of peculiar happenings which cannot be explained, and which confirm rumors they heard before moving in. The villagers dread the neighborhood of the rectory after dark and will not pass it. Daily Mirror, June 1929. Mr. Wall subsequently spent the weekend at the rectory and sent a further breathless report of his experiences. With a photographer, I have just completed a vigil of several hours in the haunted wood at the back of Borley Rectory. This wood and the whole neighborhood of the rectory is supposed to be haunted by the ghosts of a groom and a nun who attempted to elope one night several hundred years ago, but were apparently caught in the act. Although we saw only one of the manifestations which have, according to residents, occurred frequently in recent years, this by itself was peculiar enough. It was the appearance of a mysterious light in a disused wing of the building, an appearance which cannot be explained because on investigation of the deserted wing, it was ascertained that there was no light inside, although the watchers outside could still see it shining through a window. It began innocuously enough for Harry Price with a phone call. The news editor of a national newspaper telephoned me, saying that the Reverend G. E. Smith had appealed to him for help. When I replaced the receiver, I little dreamt that there was ten years' work ahead of me, probing the mystery of what was to become the best authenticated case of haunting in the annals of psychical research. Price traveled to Borley the following day. Uh, let me assure you, you'll get your report on the ghostly activity, which you may then present to the bishop. I'm well versed in dealing with delicate situations such as these. The rector and his wife, says Price, confirmed the strange events and added numerous other details. What is psychical research? A popular opinion says that it means going to seances, holding hands in the dark, singing hymns, and perhaps getting in touch with your dead relatives. 
Harry was a former engineer whose marriage to a rich wife meant that he could spend his time, and some rumored her money, investigating the paranormal. A psychical research is a science and is rapidly becoming an exact science. Initially, his focus leant towards exposing psychic frauds. If he initially had any doubts, Price soon experienced strange events firsthand and convinced of the haunting's legitimacy, told his story to the world. After tea on the day of my first visit, and after another search of the house and grounds, Mr. Wall and I arranged that when it was dusk, we would take up our vigil in the garden for a long observational period. The evening continued with further phenomena. A candlestick hurled down the stairwell, later followed by a rain of pebbles. Bells rang of their own volition. Even some of the bell pulls could be seen swinging of their own accord when we visited them.
after supper, it was suggested by the Mrs. Bull that a seance should be held in the blue room. Although it was late, I consented. Harry assured us that he would make provision for us in his will, but he never did, Mr. Wall. I suspect he was not given the chance. They still see Harry wandering the halls in his old plum dressing gown, clutching the small wallet to his chest. You suspect murder at the parsonage? We wish to converse with our brother and clarify some private matters. Any entity is present here tonight. Will it please make itself known? Our first attempts were naturally to ascertain the identity of the rapper. We asked it if it were the nun in the old legend or one of the grooms. And a single rap denoting no was the reply. Thank you for revealing your presence to us. Will you answer some questions that we put to you? Three taps for yes, one tap for no, and two taps if the answer is doubtful or unknown. Do you understand? Might I ask if perhaps you're the nun of the old legend? Very well. Might you be one of the grooms? Is it your footsteps one hears in this house? Do you wish to worry or annoy anybody here? Do you merely wish to attract attention? If we had a medium here, do you think you'd be able to tell us what the matter is? Perhaps we should ask whether it were the late Reverend Harry Ball. At this juncture, I asked the Mrs. Bull whether they might wish to question the entity, the alleged Harry Bull, as to certain private affairs of the family. Uh, the questions asked by the Mrs. Bull cannot be printed here.
Shortly after Price's first visit, the Smiths left the rectory. There were suspicions that their reason for abandoning the house were the unquiet spirits. The Smith stated that it was the property's lack of amenities. For a while, the house stood empty, leaving whatever walked the corridors at Borley Rectory to walk alone. Several vicars refused the posts before a new reverend could be found for the parish. The Reverend Lionel Algernon Foister arrived in Borley in October 1930. His wife, Marianne, was young enough to be his daughter. After the society life of London, the backwater parish of Borley must have seemed decidedly provincial. The intrigue of the rectory's reputation, however, must have had its charm. October the 16th, 1930. First experiences of anything out of the ordinary. A voice calling Marianne's name. Footsteps heard by self, Marianne, Adelaide, and a man working in house. Harry Bull, seen at different times by Marianne, between study and bedroom above. An astonishing new series of phenomena began, reaching their apex in June 1931. 
The focus appearing to be the rector's wife. November the 4th, report that a shadowy form, said by visitor to the house and by former occupants to be seen in room over kitchen, is true. Something nasty behind the curtain gave it to me. Price stated that between October 1929 and January 1932, over 2,000 paranormal phenomena occurred in the rectory, including voices, footsteps, production disappearance and transference of objects, bell ringing, and the throwing and dropping of bottles. Most infamous, however, were the messages written on the rectory walls. In 1935, the Foisters left Borley. Harry Price seized his chance. The rector's reputation well established, Price took out a 12-month lease on the property. While simultaneously placing an advert in the Times, inviting people of leisure and intellect to assist in his investigations. Haunted House. 
Responsible persons of leisure and intelligence, intrepid, critical, and unbiased, are invited to join a rota of observers in a year's night and day investigation of alleged haunted house in home counties. Uh, printed instructions supplied. With 48 unpaid volunteers from a variety of occupations, Price drew a strict set of guidelines issued to each volunteer in a volume christened the Blue Book. According to these rules, a number of controlled environments were established. Although minor phenomena were recorded by the investigators, nothing occurred during Price's occupation comparable to that during any previous consistent tenancy. During this period, Price's mind was almost certainly elsewhere. With his chosen investigators monitoring the rectory, Price was courting Bonn University and the Ministry of Propaganda in the hope of selling his laboratory and, by setting up shop under the Third Reich, gain the academic credibility in Germany that the British establishment had so long denied him. During this period, there was, however, one new development. The daughter of S.H. Glanville, Price's leading investigator, obtained hitherto unknown information about the supposed murdered nun via means of a planchette. Who is there? What is your name? How old were you when you passed over? Were you a novice?
When did you pass over? Are you under the wall? Are you at the end of the wall? Where did you hear mass? Do you want it for yourself? Whose fault was this? Our mass be sufficient. Further readings also gave insight into the Rectory's future. Does anyone want to speak to us?
Who are you? Sunex Amores mean to burn the rectory. Understanding tells the story of murder that happened there. In which room will the fire start? Why can't you give us proof here? February the 27th, 1939, a year to the day of the seance, Borley Rectory burnt down. Throughout the immolation, apparitions were reported by several witnesses. The end of Borley Rectory? Not likely. You don't need a house to be haunted. In 1943, Price dug up the floor of one of the cellars. Portions of a skull were discovered. They belonged to a young woman.
When Harry Price died in 1948, he had presented one of the best ghost stories of all time. Yet following his death, the debate upon the legitimacy of the haunting and Price's investigation of it have raged. On one side, Price was criticized for tampering with, at times even manufacturing, some of the phenomena. On the other hand, many reports aiming to discredit Price suppress a wealth of testimony independent of the investigation, which support the legitimacy of the haunting. It has been said that any ghost story tells more of its teller than of the ghost, that perhaps these tales of supernatural beings invading our lives are actually solemn meditations of what may be missing from them. Fears and longings called to life. Emotions projected and printed upon stone and timber. Rectory certainly seemed to draw eccentric characters into its fold. Were they drawn to its energies, or did they merely feed upon them? Perhaps the combination of local reputation and eccentric behavior was too good an opportunity for a lover of publicity such as Harry Price to resist. Beyond the notoriety, beyond the legends and the debate, the inevitable question remains. Was Borley Rectory truly the most haunted house in England?